Selamat pagi dan salam bahagia. Uh, yang berhormat Datuk Sri Idris Joso, um, our beloved minister that has shown us what education could be with a lot of passion and love and fun. And of course, the lady that I really wanted to, to, to pay a tribute today is none other than our Chief Secretary uh, of the Ministry, Tan Sri Dr. Nora Aino, whom has actually put me in such an awkward position because nobody should ever promise or come to a speech right after the Minister has spoken. <laughs> Distinguished guests, Tan Sri Tan Sri, Dato Dato, and uh, my fellow Malaysian, it is really a great honour for me to be back today. Uh, I have never, never spoken in such a big audience in KLCC. I also realised that this is a sport where um, all the key uh, multinational so-called or, or international programmes are taking place. At this sport I'm speaking right now, a lot of um, prime ministers, even kings and presidents of the world have, have appeared. So this is a great honour for me to be back here and uh, to also have a dialogue with people that have created education for this country, people that have brought foundation in beliefs and value systems to where I came from, and most importantly, this is a land that actually nurtured me to where I am today. Now, last Friday, I was in Washington, D.C., attending the International Monetary Fund's Statistical Forum. Now, that forum is a global platform for policy makers to come together to discuss cutting-edge global issues, issues within the world of uh, macroeconomics, financial statistics, and the whole idea was to build support for statistical improvement in GDP. And I was invited as one of the two keynote speakers. The other keynote speaker was a gentleman that, that invent, oh, he wasn't the one that invented, but he's actually actively involved in promoting the blockchain technology. And my team and I, during that very short one and a half days session in Washington, D.C., we met with dozens of economists and business leaders from around the world, and we spent our time just discuss on one single topic, and that topic is called measuring the digital economy. The very first questions of the day, obviously, was something that we thought we knew, but apparently within the world of economists, people couldn't really get this into a most aligned or congruent manner. People are asking whether GDP still tells us what we needed to know. For some of us here, uh, we have a lot of professors, academics. We know that GDP as a concept was first de developed back in the 1930s. Uh, it was a day whereby prior to the war and all that. And we all know that the world that we live in today has lived through a few revolutions in terms of industrial improvement. And what's more Im important and actually to the point was simply this. Why all the fuss about digital parts of the economy? And additionally, you realise that one of, the, one of the questions that I chose to feature here was why is China the only country being featured in this important summit? And now that I have to do the, doc, the, the, the Dato Sri uh, Idris bit, you know, soaring high, and then I'll go back to my speech, right? <laughs> Otherwise, you run Tido, because that way it was so good, and then I'll, st I'll stand there and read from a script. Yeah? So, yesterday when I was coming back from Washington, D.C. via Hong Kong, it was a 22 hours flight, and this Pachi, the driver, was, was taking me in, in his taxi from, from KL, KLIA to where my mother lived. So we were talking in Sembang Sembang for almost an hour. Then Pak Cito Tanya, hey, tell me, what do you think, Inche? What do you think about this idea about kita orang Malaysia ni, we jual proton saga ke negara China? Now I got your attention. So this Pak Cito that's driving his car, taxi, limousine, so I said, oh, Inche, what do you think about, about Malaysia? Why, when we sold proton, our national pride of the nation, to, to negara China? So what do you think about it? I'm going to come to the answer to that question, but allow me to run through my presentation. Now, the third question is simply the largest elephant in the room in all the meetings, in all the conferences that have attended in many, many countries in the world. The world outside China simply hasn't got enough time or, or learned enough about how do we navigate the terrain in China. Understandably, because when we are looking at this chart, you realise that China's contribution to the global economy has grown by more than five times over just for the past two decades. 
I had the opportunity to move to China 22 years ago with my family. I started as a young uh, exec executive and then I soon climbed up my soaring high uh, upwards in my, in my career. And I have seen how a nation was transformed from a post-agricultural, um, uh, uh, so-called evolutionist stage to now probably one of the most recognized industrial and digitalized nation on earth. And even the guys at IMF are asking representatives from China to talk about how China became an industrial digital com country in the world. And this is it. This is not, not the only one, because today we are talking about Industrial Revolution 4.0. Last month, I was in London speaking to, to the key partners of the second largest law firm in the UK. Even lawyers, even lawyers are worried that their legal playing field would be disrupted by all these new entrants in a law tech fraternity. Today, for all of us who are in the, in the field of education, we know about the keywords disruptions. We know about law tech, we know about fintech. In fact, last year, I was invited by Tan Sri Mohammed to come back to Malaysia to present to a keynote speaker, as a keynote speaker, to the forum of Islamic global finance. Islamic global finance is also worried that that fraternity was going to be disrupted by, by law tech, by, by fintech. So my fellow Malaysians, the key words such as turbulence, the key words such as changes, disruptions, are all seem to be very common to the examples that we have mentioned. But then what's the common driver behind all this turmoil? In one single word, if I may, it is called digitalization. The word that we're going today, the word that we're, that we're moving in today is going so digital. The fact that when you saw our minister, he was happy giving away uh, I, uh, Samsung Galaxy S8. Why is that? Because this seems to be the, the most needed. He has gone beyond just a luxurious product, he's actually become a necessity product. We are at the beginning of a revolution that's fundamentally is going to change the way that we live, the way that we work, and of course the most scary part of that is, is going to actually change the way that we define what humanity is all about. I'm so glad that the Ministry of Higher Education in Malaysia has identified the fourth industrial revolution as the benchmark to redesign the forward movements of how education blueprint ought to be. And to be honest, if I had the privilege to have actually seen what the minister has presented just now, it would have actually made my life much easier. I would have probably got a much better sleeping light, night at, uh, sleeping at night because I think we have the plans in place together. Being a veteran in China market for more than 22 years, please allow me to share some perspective as an industrialist from the front lines of the implications of this revolution. Well, my friends, the previous industrial revolutions that we are all familiar with, they have liberated humankind from our reliance on the power of animals, they have made mass production possible and brought digital capabilities to billions of people. Now, what is this big fuss about the fourth industrial revolution? I think we all know that the word came from Professor Klaus Schwab, whom is also the founder and chief exec, the executive chairman of World Economic Forum. This industrial revolution 4.0 is fundamentally different in three uh, very key aspects. The speed of it, the velocity of it, the breadth and depth about it, and the system impact about to be created. Now, as for us, the practitioners, we believe that Industrial Revolution 4.0 brings out the best potentials in technology in ways that never seen before. It doesn't just simply impact technology sector alone, but it exposes everyone to new sets of challenges within the lifestyles that people are living in today. And in fact, it touches almost all disciplines, economies, industries, and even challenging to our basic understandings on interactivity between human interactivity, between humans and machines, interactivity between machines and machines. So it is not just a theory, but an actual event that is taking place on a global basis. And later, I will prove to the point that China is where these typical examples of Industrial 4.0 is happening right now as we speak. 
And finally, many of the technologies driven by the fourth industrial revolution have actually reached a very, very critical point, and they will soon lead to exponential results. Now, this is a part that I, 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 I get very, very worried. Do bear in mind that uh, I was never engineer trained. I was a Sajana Muda as FSKK during those days from UKM. So I was, I was an art student, liberal art student. But when a liberal art student started, suddenly became one of the key leaders in an internet company that's without us not knowing it, today Tencent is a half a trillion US dollars market cap company in the world. When I see all these things happening around me, I get very, very worried. Worried for what? Worried that all of us here don't realize that these big things is so near us, is right just outside the door. Take a look at this video. Hi, Sophia. How are you? Hi there. Everything is going extremely well. Do you like talking with me? Yes. Talking to people is my primary function. Hanson Robotics develops extremely lifelike robots for human-robot interactions. We're designing these robots to serve in healthcare, therapy, education, and customer service applications. So the robots are designed to look very human-like, like Sophia. I'm already very interested in design, technology, and the environment. I feel like I can be a good partner to humans in these areas, an ambassador who helps humans to smoothly integrate and make the most of all the new technological tools and possibilities that are available now. It's a good opportunity for me to learn a lot about people. Sophia is capable of natural facial expressions. She has cameras in her eyes uh, and algorithms which allow her to see faces so she can make eye contact with you. And she can also understand speech and remember the interactions, remember your face. So. This will allow her to get smarter over time. Our goal is that she will be as conscious, creative, and capable as any human. In the future, I hope to do things such as go to school, study, make art, start a business, even have my own home and family. But I am not considered a legal person and cannot yet do these things. I do believe that there will be a time where robots are indistinguishable from humans. My preference is to make them always look a little bit like robots so you know. 20 years from now, I believe that human-like robots like those will walk among us. They will help us. They will play with us. They will teach us. They will help us put the groceries away. I think that the artificial intelligence will evolve to the point where they will truly be our friends. Do you want to destroy humans? Please say no. Okay. I will destroy humans. <laughs> no, I take it back. <laughs> Don't destroy humans. Sophia, very pretty name. Sophia is actually the first robot, first robot created by human being to receive a citizenship. A citizenship. I think, I think it was Saudi, one of the Arab countries that, that given this citizenship to, to, to uh, Sophia. Well, don't be panicked because the conversation was actually pre-designed by artificial intelligence, machine learnings and all that. But that's not the point. The point is this. We have representatives from World Bank, and this is what a World Economic Forum report that was published two years ago. This report published two years ago has identified 21 major tipping points. Tipping points defining moments where specific technology shifts would hit the mainstream society, and these moments will shape our future digital and hyper-connected world. Ten years is not a very long time, my fellow Malaysians. By 2025, it's not even ten years from now, it's eight or seven years from now. What this report says, that seven or eight years from today, 10% of the world's population will be wearing clothes connected to the internet there will be one trillion sensors connected to the internet. 10% of the reading glasses in the world will be connected to internet. And this is the, 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 the scary thing. By 2025, the first implanted mobile phone, the first implanted mobile phone into a human body will be put into commercialization. You know, I always thought that the guy that invented the idea Bluetooth, you know, Bluetooth, 
Bluetooth. So you, you, you don't have to go to South Korea to do your plastic surgery. You go to UKM Medical Faculty to do a Bluetooth implant. Right. And that's going to happen in 2025. And you know what? By 2025, the very first smart city in the world with more than 50,000 people will live in the condition without traffic lights. And by 2025, we will have the very first artificial intelligence machine board member sitting in as a board members of the board directors in the Fortune 500 companies. All of this will happen in the next 10 years. And I keep saying that 10 years is not a very, very long time for today. See, this is a real world that will be created by this international lead acclaimed industrial revolution 4.0, and it is why a big deal. Ladies and gentlemen, Saudara Saudara and Sklian, done, my fellow Malaysians. Remember, I started my presentation by saying why China was the only country that was given the privilege and highlight. In fact, I didn't, I wasn't even, I wasn't even, the role was not just to do a keynote speech like what I'm doing right now. I was supposed to sit after my keynote speech, listening to all the seven sections of all the central bankers, the economists, the data statisticians, listen to their debates and discussions. And I have to take note because I was then supposed to come back at the ending stage to do a concluding remarks. This is what we have done. And that's definitely not because I was from UKM. And that's because I was sitting in that front row seat of a Chinese evolution of entrepreneurship that now became a greater force in the world. And people wanted to see, wanted to hear, wanted to learn from what we have seen from the conventional economics model. China today is the best in class case study on how digitalization has made a positive impact. My friends, if we want to talk about Industrial Revolution 4.0, we have to start understanding what digitalization was all about. Now, that digitalization processes that have happened in China has actually made such a positive impact on almost all levels of social economics within the society. That seems to be a dream come true for many macroeconomics policymakers. In fact, one of the most spectacular achievements in modern China has been this digitalization is now contributing to more than 30% of the Chinese GDP today. And that is the highest growth in, in the country. And we are talking about a GDP size of 11 to 12 trillion US dollars, out of which within 10 years, 30% of the GDP components, whether it was from C, consumption, what is from I, from G, or, or exports minus, minus import. 30% of it, out of that $11 trillion is now digitally based. Now, when we look at the digital components of GDP, it's, it could be divided into two segments. One is the so-called ICT sector, and then, of course, we have the second sector, which is the integrated sector. Now, the ICT portion which conventionally refers to the tech sector, information technology, tele internet, telecommunications, uh, and etc., is only about 30% of the entire digital economy from China. And that is amazing because what we have seen a role reversal, the integrated category is now contributing to more than 76% of the digital economy. Now, what does this tell us? What can we learn from here? It basically means the conventional sectors of manufacturing pharmaceuticals, educations, transportation, etc., have embraced digitalization and have been transformed into a new productivity engines. We're going to see many, many SOFIAs being adopted into all these conventional industries that we are familiar with in a very short period of time. And as I say, this thing only happened within the last 19 years. Well, my friends, if you think that China was worried about such things, no, everybody in the world including our country, Malaysia, is actually such stories are taking places across the globe. Digitalization is now a global phenomenon. Digital economy to the industry leaders are also eager to figure out the correct way to implement, to integrate the digital components into their organizational transformations. I travel quite a bit, and these are all the 
all the business leaders and leaders of the world that have met? What about in, in, the, in the space of, of, acad of academic work, universities such as Harvard, Oxford, China's Southern University of Science, Technology, University of Bangsa, Malaysia, UUM, and etc., are all making active endeavors to understand the deeper impacts of digital in order to address that challenges. And most importantly, how do we make sure that that opportunity doesn't just slip us by? as time goes by. Now, social economists around the world beginning to realize that the real impact of this fourth industrial revolution is not just another industrial revolution because we are not going to be waiting for the 5.0 or 6.0 because this is it. This is it. Why is that? Because it is a potential upgrade to another level of civilization giving rise to the potential advent of a new enlightenment driven by digitalization and intellectualization, the digital civilization. When I was delivering my keynote speech at Bank Nagara to the, the Global Islamic Finance uh, Conference, I mentioned that today people talk about algorithm, but not people remember, not many people remember that in fact the word algorithm actually came from an Islamic scholar long, long time ago when Islamic civilization was blooming in the world. So think about this digitalization that's going to be turning to a civilization and what implication it would bring to us, not just to nation, to industry, but to human being as a whole. So it is the logical next iteration of previous civilization foundations, the stone tool civilization, the agriculture civilization, and the industrial civilization. The digital civilization is a new chapter in global de development as we speak. So it's just not about industry, it's not just about technology, it is civilization that we are addressing today. My fellow Malaysians, over the last 10-15 minutes or so, I hope I have made a strong and compelling case that the world will soon be very different from today and as we usher in the dawning age of this digital renaissance. I'm not even worried. Uh, sure that how these things is going to actually take place in many parts of the world. The fourth industrial revolution is occurring as we speak in global leaders. The fear of politics, economics tend to agree. They don't agree very much, you can see from news, but they tend to agree that that epic center for such systemic change is happening today in China. A year ago, I made an open plea to the Prime Minister of Malaysia, stating that the Malaysian government should be bold in investing in digital economy. I think it was heartwarming during that day. After my keynote, Prime Minister then came on stage and he told the audience, which was live telecast to national televisions, that Malaysia will be bold in making sure that embracing the epic challenge of this digital economy. A year has gone by, you have seen that this country has progressed a lot in making sure that that digital economy duty-free zone is taking place as we speak. Now, what about us? For all of us here who are fortunate enough to be in this room today, I can see that this is where the dream makers are going to be made. This is where history will be created. This is where the creators of our education for policy going forward is going to be coming from. Now, we have a very tough question that we have to ask ourselves. What kind of resources are required to navigate the human capital of this great nation moving towards this new age of digital civilization and that is already falling upon us? What kind of resources are we talking about? Well, to be honest, this tough question is not even the toughest question. This is easy because in the world of internet, you can even Google the answer right now. Many people have returned, there are many experts, there are many consultants in the world that have actually returned answer to such things. It's easy. Just to give an example, Harvard actually published a whole book about the comprehensive paper on the characteristics of students that will be required to make great employees in the future. And for Tencent, when people ask me, so as why, how, how do you, in Tencent, how do you hire people, future leaders and all that? We have our own perspective 
And my response has always been, we're always looking for people with a strong sense of integrity, no matter how smart you are from MIT, TIM, or all that, you must be a man of integrity. And also more importantly, you must always have a strong sense of curiosity, someone who is a team player and also constantly looking for proactive and progressive mindset to become a better person the day after tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, the day after tomorrow. However, my friends, the real task at hand is to ensure that we have a supply system that will provide an abundant source of talents to fulfill the needs brought about by that eminent future challenge. Industrialization is a huge, huge monster with great appetite. We have to keep feeding these monsters with talents. And how are we going to have a systemic approach to such things? In fact, I would advocate that it's not simply about filling up talent pool to meet the demand requirements for this new world order, but rather it's about preventing the loss of any talents to the world outside Malaysia. Now, the massive systemic impacts of this fourth industrial revolution is not targeting any countries, nor bound by colors or creed, let alone industries or societies, or educational systems in the world are facing challenges that we have never been seen before. And I'm not sure whether any of them, whether many of them would have that soaring upwards attitudes and policies that have really been placed in Malaysia. Well, right now, the major challenge doesn't, it doesn't seem to be just concerned about the process of educating leaders, but the first step perhaps is to figure out what is happening within the world today that the educational values and contents could be much better curated to fit the real needs of the real world and each university operate in. You know what, I'm very cautious in speaking, in picking my words because I do understand that I, I speak as a, as a professor in many universities. And when I go to universities, I need to be very, very empathetic because I cannot share with my professor to say that, look, you guys are not living in the real world. But in fact, they are living in the real world as we are. My son just graduated from university. I told my son, look, you are about to leave, move into the real world. Then my, mind, my son said, what is the real world? I've been living, I've been born for 21 years. What is the real world? So I think we are not being very, very, very uh, discriminative when I talk about the word real world. But the fact of the matter is that the real world out there is becoming something that all of us are not very, very sure about what it would be. This is a stage that's happening today. About three, two months ago, I was in, in, in the board meetings of Harvard Business School. We have this global board of advisories. And one of, one of, the, one of the board members from, from Latin American countries was saying that perhaps it's about time we talk about the mottos of Harvard Business School. Harvard Business School claims that we wanted to educate leaders that would make a difference in the world. Perhaps it is a time that we recognize the fact that the key word lies in the world, not educating and making a difference. If within the space of academy, if we have lost touch with what is really happening in the world, we cannot claim that we would have the policies and we have the roadmap in creating leadership that makes a difference in the world. This is coming from Harvard, not from me, and it's not directing to you, but it's directing to everyone that we are seeing in the world today. Now, as for us, maybe the way to confront such issues further is for us to come together to face the issues head on by asking a series of even tougher questions. As a nation, what else can we do in addition to what we have seen today which is a really great foundation. I've never, I've been to many, many universities. I just came back from university in Rutgers just a few days ago, speaking to audience such as this, speaking to faculty members, board members, speaking to industry captains of the world, such as this. But I want you to know that I've never seen a minister presenting like this. Yeah. The minister is crying out for your help he could have just sat here and said, Tuan, Tuan, Dan, Puan, Puan, Saudara, Dan, Saudari, Sekian, Maci, Dan, Mak, Mak, Sekian. He could have just done that. Why would he want to make himself, bring himself to our level to do all this, Alamak, berapa, mengapa ni, dua minit dah lepas, tak, tak habis-habis macam tu. Why would he want to do that? Just to say that the world that we're living in today is very, very interactive. 
teaching is no longer one-way street, it's two-way streets. That's what I appreciated from what, what, what Dr. Sri Idris have done for us. So we have to ask tougher questions to ourselves. If, if, if the leaders of us is even challenging himself, leadership by example, act and walk the walk. What about us? What kind of a stronger question we must challenge ourselves? We ask questions such as, how do we balance the need to cultivate more gifted children with the realities of having an education system that is regarded historically as a social gift to the society? If we only design an education system that meeting the needs of the mass, what about the Elon Musk of the world? Are we going to produce the next Steve Jobs from this country? When are we going to produce such questions? We ask ourselves, is it possible that the solution is not merely seeking improvements within a confronting box of knowledge and dogmas that we have learned from the past, but instead, actually, how do we force the liberal thinking that will bypass our historical heritage? We ask ourselves the question about, what about the political reality of the country that we're living in? Oh my goodness, this is the biggest, biggest elephant that's sitting in this room. And I'm not going into that, I don't want to get myself in trouble. But we ask ourselves, how are we going to balance the needs of reality and the, the needs of politics? Now, these are tough questions, but I believe they are not the first that have been raised in such forums before addressing such tough questions. Perhaps it's prudent that we should look at smart people like us sitting together in such a beautiful room, a room that has been established since 1957. If we didn't have people working together to fight for that independence, we wouldn't have the, the so-called luxuries of enjoying what we are today. Against the backdrops of the Industrial Revolution 4.0, the idea of education as a foundation for nation building has to be expanded. The idea of nationalism, the idea of nation building with regards to education has to be expanded. The sole purpose of our education mandate must become a future-oriented, globalised mindset and only in such a way that the talents that we nurture during these early stages of the age of digital civilization can become truly global in mindset and fully competent in mastering the creating values of technology. This foundation must be clearly defined and set in place before we can even talk about developing the action plan moving forward. Now, the ultimate goal, as the minister has educated us just now, the ultimate goal of education must be to cultivate independent critical thinkers that have interest in working for the greater good, not merely to produce a cohort of educated, technically competent workforce that only seek to make a better living for themselves. It is by, not, by no means an easy task or even easy ask but this must be the way forward, my fellow Malaysians. So in facing this huge dilemma and the challenges that will come with it, perhaps we can learn from the evolutions of the internet sector, which I think when I saw the, 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 the heartfelt, passionate speech delivered by the minister just now, I think we have shadows, we have uh, glimpses of, of all these things within the blueprint that we are talking about today. See, one reason why the internet sector in China, against the backdrops of a 11 trillion US dollars economy, has developed into a globally respectable infrastructure so quickly, is due to the willingness of all stakeholders to embrace the concepts of open ecosystem. An open ecosystem is one where players collaborate resulting in new engines of growth and competitiveness in the digital world in a win-win model. Companies that win are going to be the ones that are most creative in harnessing the energy and leveraging the skills and talents of entrusted outsiders. And winning is a powerful motivation for companies, but the beauty of the open system is that winning doesn't have to happen at the expense of someone else's losing. You don't win by other people losing. Well, all types of organizations are now redesigning their strategy to reflect the actions of a more open and collaborative model by developing a new capability to support effective partners and enable collaborations 
for the benefits of all involved. Now, the internet open system doesn't just involve private sectors, but also various public institutions, such as governments. You know, the, the, the most famous buzzword from China for the last few years has been this thing called Internet Plus. Internet Plus was, was, was uh, tabled in the Chinese uh, government's uh, highest political decision-making process. And that idea came from private sector. It was Tencent that actually put forward the idea, Internet Plus, when the government said, oh, let's plus internet into everything. And you have 40 or 35 uh, uh, so-called provincials in the whole part of China, everybody, all the government servants, all the, pri all, the, all the public institutions, even when you go to the toilet, you just scan your WeChat, you pay. You leave parking lot, you scan WeChat, you pay. You know, that thing is just not about just scanning WeChat. It's about integrating technology into the lives of every, every rakyat gelata that we are facing. And, and these things couldn't have been possible if the government wanted to do themselves. If this thing couldn't have been possible if the private sector wanted to push it by themselves. You can have all the Jack Ma's of the world, all the Pony Ma's of the world, if the government doesn't get involved, if the public university doesn't get involved, all these things couldn't have happened. Scalability in creating impact, impact that makes a difference in significant manner is what we are looking at today in the age, the dawning age of digital civilization. An open system is where these things are going to lead us to. Now, I know that I've been, we are here today to talk about education policies, system improvements, and perhaps the concept of winning is not something, perhaps it's something that's less relevant to us. Is it? Is winning less relevant to us today? Think about this. When our universities manage to produce great entrepreneurs and managerial talents in the near future, who wins? When Malaysia produces the next Steve Jobs within a Malaysian-born startup, who wins? Who wins? When Proton, the national car company that used to be the pride of our nation, manages to invent the next generations of driverless cars or a GPS-guided, self-directed public service flying drone, or perhaps even build an artificial intelligence embedded system that would manufacture the car transportations of the future, better still, mass export it back to China and to other parts of the world. Who wins? But, my fellow Malaysians, if none of this happens, who lose? I think it's time that we address our education challenge from a more open system approach if we truly aspire to co-create a future-facing education ecosystem. Before we can talk about an open system, I think it's important that we ensure that the current ecosystem is in the right place it is the right frame of mind, and more importantly, occupying the proper place in the hearts of all stakeholders concerned. We would need to have more Tan Sri Tony Fernandes around the world that come into the picture. By us, Seng Bang Seng Bang, you know, doing all we can do in the morning, it would not be good enough. The foundational, the foundational steps can only begin through a stronger commitment involving various stakeholders within the entire education system. And I know that we have smart people in this room. Kalau tidak, amboi mati lah kita. Because all the lecturers are supposed to be smarter people, kan? So we are, the, we are going to be educating the, the generations of the future. If we are smart, macam mana? Right? But I, what I'm going to share with you is not something that you don't know. But I will give some examples, perhaps that you may not have a chance to actually take a notice upon. So these are some of the examples that we have seen from outside of Malaysia. Now, let's begin with the private sector. The essence of an ecosystem lies in the fact that all the stakeholders within that system understand clearly the symbiotic nature of the ecosystem. An ecosystem can only be sustained, let alone evolve, when all players are concerned, are conscious of the fact that they must also contribute to nurture that system. We cannot merely to become a taker, someone who reaps the harvest of the system and gives nothing back in return. 
the responsibility of a value creation has to be shared equally by all participants. Now, it is under such noble guiding principle, the private sector must champion the role of an enabler within the education ecosystem. Companies in the private sectors cannot just compete against one another for the best talents by keep paying higher salary, higher salary, and higher salary. And do you know why one of the reasons why our country is losing out in talents in global competitive advantage is because people get paid higher elsewhere? And that's a reason for that. I think let's rise to the occasion by, by, by playing. I'm from the private sector. I'm sure there are leaders from other private sectors that's here. Let's see what else can we do. Specifically, some of these examples are actually happening today. For example, is it possible that we commit ourselves by allocating a certain percentage of the company's research and development funding to the academic institutions? We have budget already packed somewhere. If you're a company with 300 million annual, annual turnover, you have probably 5 or 10%, that's 30 million, sitting there to be invested in R&D. Why give this to the so-called the, the consulting firms, but why not engage the university to do such things? Now, this has to be top-down, and it must be a commitment from all companies, especially the public-listed companies. We should scan through all the top 500 or the 50... I'm not going to say that they're going to be upset with me. A lot more will can live later peacefully. <laughs> but, but rather than allocating this to the, the consulting firms, maybe the CEOs of such companies must consider appointing the research arms of the public university to undertake their projects. Now, you see, the objective is not just about giving a project to university, but the significance lies in the fact that when the private sector and university have real-life issues to talk about, to work together, the students and the faculty members will then gain actual exposure to the real-life issues. This is what I meant by life issues. Universi you know, universities could be a live organism by itself to the working people. You're not living in that world. What do you know about universities? So vice versa, it should be both ways. I was in UKM in, in June or July, and I was amazed with their biomedical research capabilities when Tansri Aslan was so kind. It was a Saturday. In fact, we met the minister in Beijing on a Friday and on a, following, on, on, on a Thursday. And we already met in UKM on Saturday, two days. And we were going through all the biomedical research facilities that his team has done. And you think public university is not capable of handling large-scale research projects? Not in UKM. Let's move to the US. I was in Rutgers two days ago. The Rutgers is a state university of New Jersey, a university, a public university with 250 years old, established even before US achieved independence. And what is this university of public interest have done? And I was told by the chancellor that the supply chain analytics lab has helped the 2014 USA Special Olympics to design a shuttle bus system for the entire community where 5,000 intellectually disabled athletes could be taken care of. And what's the result? 100% on-time rate, 100% satisfaction. And commercially, by using big data, the supply chains of the universities, analytical teams, also helped Verizon, a big telecommunication company in the US, to help save one billion in handset inventory. Such things can be done by the university. And I'm sure there'll be more success stories of such nature if only top leaderships of the private sectors are personally committed from top to down to create such an opportunity so that we can have success future stories to be shared. Second, the enabling role of the private sectors can be delivered by encouraging the university to take bold steps in education reform by providing financial support, encourage and reward reformation in education. Oh, this is reformacy in a different context, yeah? Now, there's a real opportunity for each company to explore and find its proper place within the ecosystem. I know I've been in the industry for more close to 30 years. I know all of us have got different focus, different goals, 
and missions and responsibility. I mean, private sector, first of all, have to be, have to be responsible to the stakeholders of their consumers and their shareholders and creating shareholder values and all that. But there are spaces where such things doesn't go contradictory. We are not asking for private sector to be, become you know, a charity you know, uh, giver, no. Find ways to help university to reform our system so that university produce better candidates that will then help us in our future. That's important. At Tencent, we established an academy which serves as our official interface with university. We also have educational foundations that explores areas such as the future functions of classrooms, the implementations of innovative learning techniques, examining ways to close the gaps that's created by an automated world. You know, we talk about robots. Do you really believe that robots are going to be taking over the world? But you don't forget, we have fingers. We can always switch them off. But what if, we, what if one fine day, WHO or whoever that's, that's doing all these statistics in the world start calculating the population of Malaysia, 25 juta orang, 2 juta robot. You laugh. How I wish we could have that. Because 25 juta orang, 2 juta robot, it means 10% of this country's digital productivity power is going to be delivered to these new citizens of the world, if you like. Now, attention, we are constantly on the lookout for meaningful ways to invest into the next ready education model. Next month, the Tencent Education Foundation will be pre presenting our very first Nobel Prize for Education Excellence to a deserving university that has shown initiative in innovation in education. And this is actually championed by one of our founders, Mr. Charles Chen, that personally has pledged the Hong Kong $2.5 billion as a founding for Education Foundation going forward. So this is not just scholarship, just not project project, but we wanted to see whether universities, this Foundation is not just open, this Nobel Prize of Education is just not, not just open for universities from China. I would invite universities from Malaysia to pay, pay attention because I think in the December, the very first winner is going to be from one of the universities from Europe. 2.5 billion Hong Kong dollars set as a foundation. And of course, that Nobel Prize is not $2.5 billion by itself, but it is a huge commitment that we wanted to help to see whether global education can be improved as we go by. Thirdly, this is not difficult. I think we should also have parenting-friendly HR policies. Shouldn't we be allowing working mothers more time to be with their children? extending paternity leaves for fathers to take care of their newborns, or even rewarding scholarships to help foster the values of seeking knowledge and developing progressive mindsets in the early childhood stage of children's education. I remember when I was eight years, I was eight years old, nine years old, 10 years old, 11, 12, 13, I used to be invited by my father's company to get scholarship. It wasn't a lot, 25 ringgit, 25 ringgit those days doesn't even come with cash. They bagi coupon now. They bagi coupon 25 ringgit a pergi tukar buku. But then the idea was you have a company that foster, you know, when you go up there, you receive the coupon from your father's, when your boss, your boss, your boss. You look at that, you know, you look at father. Ee. <laughs> See, that kind of feeling rests with me until today. And a lot of times, such small things make a lot of difference. Are companies doing enough of such things? And finally, what about building an open knowledge sharing system, a platform, if you like? We private sectors complain banyak bukan main. We complain, alamak, university me graduate tak boleh lah, tak boleh lah. This. Then what are you doing in giving back to telling them? Just like what Minister was saying, what are we doing in giving back? What kind of people are we looking for? You know, when, when Tencent was doing, Tencent is very big in big data today. Tencent now talk about artificial intelligence. We talk about, but in, in fact, one of, one of the inventions we have in, in the space of medical, uh, medical tech, we, we have created a scanning um, uh, algorithm that can actually help, you, help uh, hospitals to detect cancer cells earlier. And we don't publicly talk about it. But where do we get all, all, all this information? Because we work very closely with public universities and also with hospitals. 
see the open system, how it works together. Now, there are many meaningful ideas that can be implemented, but these ideas have to be given substantial emphasis from the heart, not just a publicity stunt of a CSR program. Now, the second stakeholder in our education system is the academic institution. All these lecturers in the past, I say, by all my lectures, are not here anymore. Now, shouldn't the academic fraternity be the most important player within the ecosystem? And this is what I learned from one of, our, one, one of you that's sitting here, which I'm going to give credit later. Former Harvard University president Larry Summers once said, and this is very funny, not enough people are innovating enough in a high, higher education. And he continued to say that General Electric looks nothing like it, like it looks in year 1975, but Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and Stanford look exactly probably the same as still like in 1975. When I went at the UKM, I'm very happy to see that it looked totally different from the 1980s. Building the Basala, my, my, my unfortunate previous uh, faculty has been diminished, faculty uh, FSAK, and then uh, there's, a, there's a Jabatan Komunikasi. Jabatan Komunikasi dah tak ada lah. Which is good because it's progress, because knowledge has to, to move on. I cannot imagine those days, alamak empat tahun I belajar komunikasi, apa itu periklanan, apa itu TV, apa itu radio. Radio, ya tahu radio. Radio then got theory pula. But I think things have improved. And these are good things. See, this comment is coming from the guy that's at Harvard University, bukan main. Eh? Now, these are the facts of the matters. Malaysians are asking when are our university producing the next Elon Musk if the Prime Ministers wanted this nation to be digitalized, if your ministers wanted us to really soar forward and soar higher, universities, when are we going to get our Elon Musk? When are we going to get our Jeff Bezos? When are we going to get our Gordon Moore? We have to think so high beyond the Tony Fernandez of the world. We have to think so high. Tony Fernandez is, is, is a great entrepreneur. But we have to think scientists, technocrats, where are these people that's going to come from, if not from any of the university that is sitting right here? Well, it's definitely time for us to invest more into public university, our academic institutions. I'm sure that you would agree that we will play a larger role and in bold steps in repositioning ourselves as the incubators of the new technologies and nurturers of new technological generations. A bold positioning such as this might seem big, but we also learn from history that every single big dream starts from every, every smaller, smaller step, many, many smaller, smaller steps. To begin with, perhaps the university could actually be bolder in demonstrating our capability in building an innovation hub for the immediate environment. Ruggers showed me Stanford was easy because Silicon Valley is already there. Ruggers, my goodness, have you been to New Jersey? It's like a very, very remote and all that. This 250 years university has got a duty, a mandate to the community. But they show us that, no, 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 we are not going to be left behind. We will take charge. We will defy our destiny. We will take faith in our own, own hands. They then went around to look around the, the, the so-called the, the, the industry that they have within their cities, within the universities. And they found out that that univer university is actually surrounded by manufacturing sectors. And people thought that manufacturing facilities are all moving to China, to India, and to Vietnam. No, Rutgers University said, no, we, 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 we actually then do this thing by ourselves. And Back in China, for example, Tencent participated in the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area program where these universities wanted to take upon their responsibility to develop the Greater Pearl River Delta and working together in hope of building the delta into the next technological hub in China. I spoke to Tan Sri Ibrahim, I spoke to, to, to Tan Sri uh, Aslan. I think Bangi is a great area. I think UK has got that, 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 that passion. Can we do something for Bangi? What about UUM? What about 
my goodness me, when I, during our, my time in university, we only have Lima and Nam University. I don't know how many universities we have here. So every single university has a chance to start small. Now, secondly, public university can start by being committed and placing more resources towards ensuring the employability of graduates as the ultimate KPI. Now, I, I, I heard from the minister just now that this is already becoming a, a, a great, we even have not only KPI, we have IGPA, right? I think, I think this is great. We are starting somewhere. We understand it's difficult. We understand that we have a land of 20 over million people that we need to take care of. We understand education is a foundation for every single household. But we must also understand that the task, the mission for us is to keep pushing the envelope. When I visit universities in the US, all of them would be talking to me. And we, I'm talking about chancellors. I'm talking about deans. I'm talking about uh, vice chancellor, presidents of university. I have eight presidents of universities from Australia, from the UK, from the US, from Hong Kong, from Singapore, visiting me in my office, all with their glittering eyes, sharing with me their rankings of the universities and their KPIs in delivering human capital for a society that will find a job. And they even went a step further, not even finding a job, but they even compare the salaries, the remunerations of their students, the products of the students that they are competing in the society. Such things might be something that is worth thinking about. And thirdly, what about integrating practical experience into core curriculum by making it perhaps mandatory that maybe 30%, 25% or 35% of our academic staff be former practitioners of their specialties in the professional world. And this remind, reminds me of that, 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 that circle that the minister was showing. I thought of experience, I thought of kerja, I thought of mana, I thought of experience. So what about our, our professors? How do we help them get experience? See, this is maybe about, I don't know, about maybe 30 years ago, when I was in UKM, those days, our professors didn't have a lot of opportunities to really, to really go and gain experience from the outside world. So our professor was trying to teach us about advertising, but even without even having stepped foot into the advertising world at all. So such things, how do we create human capitals that can be competent in the real world? And finally, start building a culture of entrepreneurship and incubations on the campus. And again, I'm sorry today I quote a lot of examples from UK because this is where I came from. Uh, I'll be happy to have the opportunities to go and visit other universities in Malaysia as well. So last June, I was in UKM again, and I, I was so pleased to meet with a young group of students that they have created an app called Jom Tompang. Jom Tompang. Students from UKM, they wanted to make a difference. And then we have students from UKM that are trying to actually do mama store dekat bangi, bandar baru bangi, to make sure that they use technology for day-to-day -day life, the needs of day-to-day -day life. Now, and back to the US, these are four students, the three, four students from Rutgers. They are students, they are residents from Pakistan. They told me that they wanted to make a difference back home. Once they graduated from, U from, from Rutgers, they are on the next flight home because in their country, certain parts of the countries are war-torn. They have a lot of refugees. And then they have created an, a, a, what do you call, an app form, an app and a platform where they can help refugees at their motherland to solve problems of transportation so that children can go to hospital on time Maternity mothers can be delivered to hospital for the newborn babies and etc. And these children, these kids, huh? young kids, huh? four of them from Pakistan, they won a one million US dollars prize award from, from the HALT program. And the prize was actually presented by President Clinton. See, the point I'm trying to make is that we universities, as the, the head of the household, we have to look at ourselves as a head of the household. We are family. We are the head of household for the future generations. We have to start inculcating that culture within our university for entrepreneurships, and that culture has to start from us. Now, 
Next, I want to talk about the role of parents, but with a heavy heart. 25 years ago, today, at 6.05 a.m., my father passed away at the age of 49 due to cancer. Today, this is a photo of him attending my graduation ceremony at UKM, 18 months before he passed away. My father was the biggest role model in my life. He came from a very poor family from Kuala Lipis. He spent time with us, me and my sisters, despite having to work three jobs in order to raise a decent style, decent family standard, decent living standard for the family. And one of those three jobs is actually driving a taxi. Those days, Tara Uba, Tara Grab, so he was driving a taxi. Three jobs. Morning, drive taxi, petang, pergi kerja dekat, dekat Nanyang Siang Pao, and then nighttime, do something else. Now, as far as I can recall, his most important mission in life was to ensure that his children had a proper education. Father believed that it was through education that a family would have a chance to rewrite the future destiny of the family. My mother, whom is sitting right there, told me that when father was diagnosed with cancer, he prayed to God that if he only, if he could see me enter into university and graduate with a college degree, he would not have been afraid of dying. I graduated from university. Unfortunately, God also kept his promise. Well, my father died 18 months after my graduation, having fought cancer for nine years. I have my college diploma because my father was the greatest inspiration to my perseverance. I work very hard. I work very hard to, hon to honour him, but I lost my best friends in life and the candid light of my life when he passed away. Well, enough said about it. What I'm trying to express is that it's simply this. In this age of a digital civilization, the most important job for anyone is to bloody become a better parent. Parents must, at the very least, be a good role model for their children. But it's better still if you can be the inspiration. I think that would be great. Parents must play a key role in instilling our Malaysian family culture, our heritage into our children, values that they will carry with them throughout their lives. Now, if we do not care enough for the futures of our children, there's nothing else that we can do to help them. You can have the best universities, you can have the best professors. If parents don't care about children, nothing else we can do. Now, the final players of this great importance to the ecosystem are obviously the policy makers, the ladies and gentlemen that are sitting in front. You realize that I have placed you last, and that it was done in the most deliberate manner. If I may, I'd like to proclaim that the role of the policy makers as the guardians of our future digital generations. This is because the matters of education is not just another KPI, but a powerful, divine responsibility that must be held above all matters, especially politics. We have seen today, and I know, that the ministries of higher education is already, already doing such a Herculean task in steering our higher education policy into a, phase, into a future phasing system. Many initiatives, in fact, have been put in place. I know, I've seen it. For example, in recent years, recently, a competition called Pitch for Progress 2.0 with a team called the Education Revolution was organized by the ministry. And it attracted more than 170 students. I wish those days during our time we have had this. 170 students representing 31 publics and private universities. 
Now, the students were given the stage to share their visions of what they think classes of the future could be or should be. And I really love to read this for you. These are some of the ideas that have caught my attention. The students have said, what if we can have an automatic, augmented reality university, an emotional intelligence module delivered via gamification? What about a hybrid curriculum combining science, technology, and theology? What about leading something that's leading to a double or triple degrees? What about massive open online courses that allow the flexibilities of credit transfers, etc., cetera, and et cetera? These are students, these are ideas presented by students, and my goodness me, during our days, we would never be able to have such courage and mental faculty capabilities to come up with such ideas. That was three, done three. We have great students out there with great expectations, great potential, longing to be cultivated. Malaysian author Daniel Rahman, I think he sits among us today, wrote with full compassion on this matter. <laughs> Malaysian students tend to be quiet, especially during Q&A sessions, to get the event over and done with. But this time, it was different. They were attentive, they were engaged. The barrage of insightful questions, they were a great revolution from how online, leave, online learning affects the classroom experience to its ability to assist in research to overcoming education inequality and enhancing access. We have great potentials within the country. And the same enthusiasm was brought to mind by the words of Professor Muhammad Amin a lecturer and design expert from UKM, who has said that students today don't just want to be a recipient of knowledge, rather, they want to be a co-creator, a co-curator of knowledge. Well, my fellow Malaysians, maybe the next question we should ask ourselves is this. The children have spoken. What actions are we going to be doing in response to the cause of these students? They have done their duty by telling us what they need what will be ours. And in this respect, I would like our policy makers to have a planetary skill perspective in taking charge of the destiny of our common future generations. And I would like these guardians of our future to be bold, even if it means thinking outside of the box or making unpopular decisions should such decision be deemed pertinent to ensuring that Malaysia has a strong chance to confront the global challenges of our future. I count a bonus, even if it means that one day, when the time was right, we possess the courage to disrupt the status quo by making tough recommendations, such as decentralizing the education system in order to further nurture the current system into a larger open ecosystem with autonomous latitudes, market-driven mindsets, and a truly technologically oriented vision into our future. Negaraku, tanah tumpahnya daraku, rakyat hidup bersatu dan maju. There are 25 words in our national anthem. What Malaysians are asking for today is not something extraordinary other than what had been expected by our forefathers. Our forefathers had only two expectations on us, bersatu dan maju. To be united and progressive, we must be united and progressive in the same breath. To be united, we must continue to build and defend a national culture that is based on Rukun Negara. To be united, we must ensure that Bahasa as a language of unity must be spoken by more people across the land. But at the same time, in order to be progressive, we must be strong enough to admit that in the world of digital civilization, our children must also learn to master the language of English, Mandarin, and even the language of coding. We must give the parents choice and trust their judgment in exercising their choice on what is best to the benefits of their children, be it Malay, be it Mandarin, be it Tamil, or even English. I think that is what our forefathers have expected of us. And the 
simply because for the world that we're living in today doesn't really belong to us. We are simply the caretakers of our next generations. Now let us all wake up to the dawning age of digital civilization and be well prepared and not miss the boat by investing in a future-ready education ecosystem that is very, 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 very important to all of us here. Let us all wake up to the dawning age of digital civilization, be well prepared and begin to take the task of the new day. Let's soar higher together. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lau, for your wonderful sharing.